my presentation today isn't really based on some uh, uh, groundbreaking research, but it just sort of uh, started a year or so ago that uh, I was doing some planning for a walk I was putting together last summer, and I came across a reference to a spot north of Gravelberg um, and, and, uh, that I'd never heard about before. And having been born in Gravelberg and lived in a small town close to there, I'd been past or near this site many, many times and didn't know anything about it. So um, I decided last fall to do a bit more investigation about uh, this site, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit later on as part of the presentation and keep you on edge till then. <laughs> so, um, so this is my sort of investigation about uh, this site uh, connected to the Northwest Mounted Police March West. Um, and that's a topic that some of you are probably familiar with, some maybe not so much. Uh, but I'll start with a bit of background to, the, uh, to how that march started and then uh, focus most of my talk about the trail across Saskatchewan as part of the March West. Now, just a bit of background there. The early 70s were an important time for the development of Canada as we know it. And uh, one of the big ones there, 1870, the transfer of Rupert's land from the Hudson Bay Company to the uh, Dominion of Canada. And uh, uh, of course, part of the strategy was to get BC to come in on side. And so they were promised a railway as part of the deal to to join Canada, and uh, and so they committed to join Canada in 19, or, pardon, 1871, and then of course the, the the rail line was to follow after that. And part of the, the getting the railway across was to deal with the indigenous people uh, between Ontario and uh, and the coast, and so that's where your numbered treaties come in as well. And I'll talk a bit just slightly about that. Uh, but again, also to establish the boundary between the uh, U.S. and Canada. So the boundary survey started in 1873. They went as far as uh, Dufferin, south of Winnipeg, to Wood Mountain, and that completed the first season. And then, so they are back at it in 1874, the same year that the, the March West occurred. Now, um, the North Mount Police was sort of the, the, uh, the bill introduced into Parliament uh, was in May of 1873. And... Uh, uh, initially, they just thought, well, they would just train uh, uh, recruits down in Ontario, and then eventually, when they get around to it, they'll you get out west. But a couple things happened, and the Cypress Hills massacre on June 1st, 1873, was one of those incidents. And the news about that massacre, massacre didn't get back to uh, eastern Canada, and then back out west to to the Red River area for another couple of months. Uh, but uh, Lieutenant Governor Morris in um, in Manitoba was a bit concerned about that, and he. Uh, uh, complained to the federal government, which initiated then, rather than training in Ontario, they shipped 150 guys out to uh, the Fort Garry area, and they were there in place in the fall of 1873. And then uh, subsequently in, in 1874, in the spring, another 150 recruits were uh, moved out west, and uh, thus began the march with roughly 300 um, officers, constables, sub-constables, and various uh, levels. So that's a bit of a long way to start. It's a little bit washed out there, but that's what the map of Canada would look at that time. Um, don't uh, or disregard, in a sense, the, the stars there. That just shows you where the capital of the Northwest Territories were, uh, beginning at uh, Winnipeg and then Battleford and then off to Regina. But uh, just to give you a sense of uh, BC and, uh, and uh, Rupert's Land and so on. And of course, Manitoba is just the postage stamp province, as we've heard. Okay, and then just, uh, of course, this is important to mention as well. Uh, 1874 was the signing of Treaty number four, which covers uh, this part of the province and into Manitoba and into Alberta, roughly up to Medicine Hat and then down to the, to the U.S. border. So that happened, uh, the first signing was in, uh, at Fort Capel in, in September of 1874. So these uh, mounties were marching west uh, just slightly before that happened and they got back east after the fact. So there's a lot of things happening in terms of the federal government uh, that year. Oh, just a bit of a note there too. You see the blue there is, is actually part of uh, Treaty Number 2 territory. But the bands at Moose Mountain area, they're actually signatories to Treaty Number 4, even though they reside in Treaty 2 territory. Okay, here's a bit of a, a map to show you what's kind of what's happening. Uh, but the uh, July 8th is when they start out from Dufferin, Manitoba, right on the U.S. border there. And they were happy to go along, uh, along the, the border. Um, but the year before, because it was, a, it was a joint survey, the U.S. were there as well. But the U.S. had a lot of military presence because they were scared of the natives getting unruly, and so they were protecting their surveyors along there. And by doing that, I mean, it agitated the, the Sioux, who were already agitated because back in 
1862, there was the so-called Sioux uprising in Minnesota. And so these Sioux that were kind of moving west because of that were there pushing other indigenous people further west and uh, a lot of confusion and, and unrest at that time. So they were uncertain what these guys were doing, all these fancy equipment and, and the military presence. So there's a fair bit of agitation. And so it was advised um, that the, uh, rather than f sort of follow the same path as the, uh, the boundary survey, that they get away from the border so they don't have any incidents there that could cause you know, a conflict and disrupt the whole thing. So that's why uh, they got as far as Rosh Piercy. And uh, because they were, they were so ill-equipped, Ill they had uh, run out of oats for the horses by that time. Um, a lot of the men, a lot of the horses, animals were sick. And uh, so uh, Commissioner French, who I'll get to in a second, who was leading it, made the decision that he would divide the, the troops in half and that half would go to uh, Fort Edmonton via uh, Fort Ellis there which is part of the, the, the plan initially, that they would have a, pres a, military pres a, pardon me, a police presence in Fort Edmonton as well. So he, he saw that things were in such bad shape that there's no sense dragging these guys along into no man's land, in a sense, from the way he was seeing it, that they could get some respite at Fort Ellis and then make their way up to, uh, to Fort Edmonton. So Jarvis was the guy who, who, uh, took, who led that uh, move up there. So now I'm gonna pick up the story. Um, as they start to curve away from the border there, they get just past Estevan, and, uh, and uh, then they start moving sort of northwest. Okay, so here's the characters for this, uh, this story. So uh, Commissioner French, he's the leader. He's uh, 33 years old. And uh, this is a, obviously a later photograph uh, uh, of him. And then James McLeod, he was assistant commissioner. He wasn't the guy that French wanted as his assistant commissioner, so he was a little bit rallied, uh, riled up uh, to begin with. Um, but the federal government insisted that this guy be uh, commissioner because he had some experience in the West. He was five years older than French was. Maybe there's a bit of a conflict there. Now, some of you will know this, this name from Cypress Hills will never be the same. So Fred uh, Begley was the, uh, was the uh, trumpeter for, he was only 15 years old, so he was a trumpeter. He wasn't old enough to be a regular constable. And uh, <clears throat> I said Begley, Bagley. Uh, and so he, uh, he was along with them. And what I'm going to be doing, he kept a diary of his, his walk, and that's what I'm going to be referring to for the most of this trek uh, west, is reading from his diary uh, along the way. And somebody else that's going to be a character in this episode here is uh, Henry Julian. And uh, he was uh, 22 years old, and he was uh, uh, um, an illustrator with the Canadian Illustrated News. So French had asked some, some sort of a, a press to be along to help record what happened along the way. So Henry Julian was uh, the guy assigned to follow the Northwest Mountain Police West. And so he, I'm going to be referring to a lot of his sketches. You'll see a lot of his sketches. Uh, he's, he was uh, taking down notes, and uh, he also had a diary. So I'll refer to some of his diary entries. But most of the diary entries, unless I say otherwise, are from uh, Fred Bagley. OK, so you start, start the story with a dark and stormy night. And then I'll pick up, uh, we're on August the 4th now, 1874. And again, this is Bagley's part of his diary entries, not the whole thing, I just excerpted some of them. Very, uh, very heavy thunderstorm about 1 a.m., tents blow down, some horses stampede. And then later on in the day, uh, it's very hot, go northwesterly to dirt or cactus hills. Colonel McLeod and six carts go to Wood Mountain for pemmican and dried meat, make about 20 miles. Okay, so Estevan, they came in, and now they're starting to head northwest. This is Long Creek. There's a service river there, Long Creek. And then uh, with uh, um, McLeod going to get some dried meat from, from uh, Wood Mountain, there's an old trail here that the, the Métis freighters used to use for about at least six years out of uh, Winnipeg to Wood Mountain. Uh, and uh, it's called the Trader's Road. And it would have come down here, and it came through here, and that was, um, you can see this, this topographical map, it's kind of the easy way to go around the hills rather than over top of them. <clears throat> okay, so that was the first day. Uh, August the 6th, uh, March at uh, 6 a.m., about 11 miles. In p.m., uh, some reached summit of dirt hills. Steep climb took several toll on animals, severe toll on animals, especially the gun horses. They're also pulling some mortars, some heavy, heavy machinery there. Uh, the column is scattered all over the hills, at least 10 miles between the advance parties and the rear guard, and prairie fires in the distance. And there's, uh, 
Julianne's drawing of them struggling to get over top of the hills there. The next day, in camp on dirt hills all day to rest the horses and allow scattered parties to assemble. Very hot, 91 degrees. Next day, march at 5.30 a.m., descend the west slope of dirt hills. Part of the force reaches Old Wives Lake at 11, 11 p.m. It's a large lake, very salty, much diarrhea, clouds of feathered game of all kinds. And uh, that's um, the top left-hand corner there is the bottom side of uh, Old Wise Lake. But you can sort of get a sense of how rough the, the, the hills are there. If you have never driven through there, it is, they are very rough hills. But anyways, they're making their way to Old Wise Lake. Uh, the next day, Reveille at 6 a.m., a church parade at 10.30. And after the parade, bathing and washing horses. Every Sunday they, is a day off. That's pretty good. So there's Julianne's drawing of uh, having a wonderful time in the lake, horses and men and, and everybody else. The next day, Reveille at 6 a.m., uh, in camp all morning, made about six miles in the afternoon and camp along shore of the lake, McLeod with pemmican and bales of dried meat rejoin us from Wood Mountain. There's poor grass and bad water, plenty of cactus here. So McLeod returns uh, with about 4,700 pounds of dried meat and, uh, and everybody's happy. Uh, okay, so there's the bottom of the lake, and if you can see there, this is, uh, you can count the, the sections here, so it's almost like one, two, three, four, five, six, so I'm, I'm guessing from the diary that they camped someplace here, and it's six miles the next day, they're uh, down here. Okay, uh, next day, uh, Reveille at 4 a.m., March at 6, made about 23 miles and camp on Old Wives Creek. About 50 lodges of Sioux Indians camped here. And Julianne uh, also indicates, uh, the water in the creek is not good, but the branch falling into it is very good and cool. There's huckleberries and cherries, in brackets dry, which would be choke cherries, and the men feast on them. This is the Wood River, but they're calling Old Wise Creek because it flows into Old Wise Lake. So they're calling this Old Wise Creek. And again, if you count the miles, it comes uh, down here. Now I'm. I'm bringing him down to this area here. This is actually not a creek running into it as described in the diary, but it's actually like a, a, a drainage channel like a, for, for spring runoff. Now, this is the Nauticue Creek that runs into the Wood River at that point. This is clouds that are obscuring the picture a little bit. But so the, the Wood River, you know, just east of Gravelberg, running up into Old Wise Lake. But I'm guessing that this is where they're at here um, as it runs into the Wood River. Okay, this is August the 12th now. Colonel French sent an invitation. Remember, we got some Sioux there. Colonel French has sent an invitation to the Sioux chief for a powwow. Okay, the next day, the Sioux chief and a large number of warriors arrive in camp for a powwow about 10 a.m. There's presents of tobacco, flints and steels, cloth, etc., made to them, and then speeches. Both sides gave speeches. And Julianne has also captured that in the watercolor. Now, I don't... The tents weren't that high, so he's using a little bit of artistic <laughs> license there. But it, the idea is captured there that uh, the chief is giving a speech and everybody's sitting around, or at least the, the main people are sitting around uh, to hear it. Okay, so uh, uh, August the 14th, uh, remain in camp on the creek. Many of our men visit the Sioux camp and trade with them. Got a couple of pairs of buffalo hide sold moccasins. The Indians demonstrate their skill with a bow and arrow. There's dancing and McLeod with 16 carts goes to Wood Mountain for oats, going for oats this time. And so they stay camped there for three days, actually four days. <clears throat> I'm jumping ahead here to August 17th. Uh, again, Bagley uh, camped on Old Wives Creek. McLeod and a man named Hirschmer arrived from Wood Mountain. Now, anybody knows Northwest Mounted Police history, Hirschmer was uh, later commissioner. Lawrence Hirschmer was commissioner in 1886 of the uh, Northwest Mounted Police. But at this time, he's working for the Boundary Survey and he happens to be stationed at Wood Mountain. And I should also mention here that, uh, uh, now why are they going to Wood Mountain for Oats? Well, see, the Boundary Survey, they, they had good leadership. They were establishing advanced posts uh, with stores for their purposes along the way. So they had, uh, they were called the, uh, the 49 Raiders, 49th Parallel Raiders. So they were a, a group that were always establishing camps ahead of time. So when all the workers, at the end of the day, lo and behold, there's, uh, there's a fire camp, there's a camp, there's cooked meal ready, ready for you. None of this happened with the Northwest Mounted Police. 
But anyways, so the, uh, the Boundary Survey had built this, uh, this depot at Wood Mountain. And they knew about this, and that's why they could go down and send uh, McLeod down there to get this. And just by coincidence, at the end of uh, the year before, 1873, the, uh, the Boundary Commission uh, survey, they ordered 60 tons of oats from Helena, Montana, for them to bring up the next spring to be there. So when they come out, in, they're actually a month ahead of, uh, of the North of Mount Peace. So when they got there, then there was these oats. But they also, just to, be, just to be safe, they also brought oats with them. So there were these extra 60 tons of oats at the Wood Mountain uh, Depot, which fortunate for the North of Smile Place were there for their purposes. And there's another, the whole little side story here about Hertzmer giving him a price and, and uh, French not happy with the price that he's charge, <laughs> charging, but he's got no, he's got no, uh, you know, nothing to do about it. And there's a comparison too about the value back then is about the same as they are today in terms of what you get oats at the, at the elevator. Anyways, that's on a side note. So, well, okay, we're back on, on Old Wise Creek, um, also Wood River in our day and age. So uh, now Hertzmer and, uh, and McLeod are back, but the oats are still coming. So the, day, the next day, oh, pardon me, they were still on August 17th, the Sioux break camp and move a few miles up creek, having been joined by Rising Bull, son of Standing Bull. Family connections, we don't know. But anyways, there are two of them named there who are part of this large group. The next day, uh, McLeod's 16 carts loaded with uh, 60,000 pounds of oats arrives from Wood Mountain. And 16, if you, I've done the math on this, uh, Red River carts, how much they could carry or typically did carry. Well, 16 carts didn't, didn't cut it. But there were some wagons at the, at the post that they used as well to, to bring up some of, the, some of the oats. OK. So let's see. Uh, and just again, by chance, I should have had this on a little earlier, uh, this is the, the depot that the Boundary Commission had constructed. Uh, on, and this is a photograph from 1874. Okay, on August 19th, um, Julian says, we moved two miles and formed Cripple Camp under command of Constable J. Sutherland. And then we go 12, uh, 12 and a half miles, which brought us uh, to, again to Old Wise Creek. I'll explain that. Uh, Bagley says, uh, Cripple Camp formed, Constable James Sutherland is in charge, with seven constables, five of them six, sick, a Métis, 26 horses, and 12 wagons. Um, he doesn't mention the two miles. So I'm suggesting that uh, this is the site of the Cripple Creek Camp, north of Gravelberg. And uh, in my comings and goings last fall, the RM of Gravelberg has designated this area, a large area around here, uh, several sections, uh, not several sections, hectares, um, as uh, municipal heritage property. But this is labeled Cripple Creek here. But again, that's not what I'm saying is the campsite, but that's where they spent those four days here and there, and then moved two miles down to where the uh, Nautica Creek runs into the Wood River. So they're calling the Wood River Old Wise Creek. They're calling Nautica Creek Old Wise Creek. And a little bit further north, there's Wywa Creek, which they also is the north branch of the um, Old Wise Creek. So there's three different bodies of water, all with the same name there. This is where I was last October. There's the first, looking up that uh, first valley. And there's uh, this, the point there, looking this Wood River there, so to the, uh, to the left. And it, it looks fairly flat there, but it's actually, I have my GPS, it's 100 feet drop from where I'm standing down to the, to the meadow below here. This is all, this is all uh, uh, seeded with hay in through there, so. But very, very pretty spot. And this is just on the other side looking on the right. So the same, standing in the same position, but just the, the curve in the Wood River there winds around and then goes off to that first photograph there. Okay, so we're gonna head west here. So let's pick it up. Uh, here's the Nautica Creek flowing into the Wood River at Gravelberg. So I'm suggesting they're heading west of there. And uh, I think the diary entries support that. Uh, Reveille at 4 a.m., March at 6.30. No wood, grass, or water at noon camp except in a pool where apparently a large number of buffalo had wallowed and so contaminated it that even after repeated boilings and skimmings, it remains as black as ink. All ranks gathered buffalo chips and stored them in gunny sacks. Camp for night on Old Wives Creek. Uh, next day, this is August 21st. Uh, Reveille at 3 a.m., March at 5.30. After 10 miles, halt amidst acres of very tall cactus. Father Lestank, and party of Métis here on way from Cypress Hills to Edmonton, but they are going to Coppell first of all. 
and so here, and they actually stopped and they searched them for um, uh, for liquor. So there, this is this is a drawing of uh, of them stopping and searching all of the carts for for liquor, and they found none. Uh, August twenty second, rained all last night. Buffalo chips wet, so no meals. Fill our pockets with brittle dried meat and carry on. Colonel McLeod and Captain Walker, with twenty seven carts and as many men, left for White Mud River, where there's another Boundary Commission depot, uh, for oats. No fire, no supper. We come to another branch of Old Wives Creek, which was nearly dried up and salty. So this is the other branch of the Old Wives Creek I'm saying is Russell Creek, and they're following Russell Creek up there. And anybody who's been in those hills south of, southeast of Neville there, there are fossils in those hills there. Uh, anyways, and here's another reference to what I just said. Um, the next day, we are camped at Flapjack Hill on a branch of Old Wives Creek. So again, this Russell Creek was into the hills, and that's probably where they camped for that one night. Uh, and then the church prayed at 10.30. Okay, on the 24th, Julian says, we reach Lake La Plume, 10 more miles to Riviere au Courant in a beautiful valley. Bagley doesn't mention Lac La Plume, but he says, Reveille at three, March at six, fine day, not quite as hot as it has been, plenty of buffalo chips. It is the duty of everyone to gather as many as possible. March over 20 miles and camp at Swift Current Creek, pitch camp in moonlight. Okay, so Lac La Plume is mentioned, so when I say they follow this, here's Lac Pelche, they hit the bottom end of Lac Pelche, and then this, which is now present day Reed Lake, would have been Swift Current Creek, and so that's where I'm saying they camped there. And then the 25th, uh, Bagley says, a large fatigue party cuts down banks of creek so that the column, especially the field guns, are able to cross. So there's obviously steep banks on uh, Swift Current Creek. Uh, March at 7.30 a.m., about 15 miles, and camp in a valley in the Cypress Hills. Poor water and grass. Now, I don't think it's the Cypress Hills. So they uh, went here and then went there 15 miles here. That brings you about 10 miles south of Gull Lake on the 37 Highway. So it starts to get hilly there, but it's not the Cypress Hills as we know them. But they don't know that. They've heard about the Cypress Hills, but they, they, aren't, they aren't there, the, the true hills. Julian says, we reach Cypress Hills, camp on banks of one of several small lakes on north side, uh, remain several days waiting for McLeod and Walker to return with oats. So remember, Walker and McLeod have gone to someplace on the Frenchman River for the oats. And so they stay there, they, and they're waiting for, for them to return. And even in the evenings, they, they send up flares to try to uh, show them where they're located. But they stay there for six days. And uh, catch up here. And then on the, tw on the 29th, they say, uh, get wood from distant hills. So were they going to somewhere closer to the Cypress Hills to actually get wood to bring back to the camp while they're waiting for uh, McLeod to return? On August the 30th, this is five days later, uh, the horses stampede at daybreak, but all recovered within two hours. Church parade at 10.30. Two Métis scouts shoot a buffalo. The meat is enjoyed by everyone. That's the first buffalo they've seen uh, coming west, is that day. The next day, uh, this is six days later, McLeod and Walker with escort and brigade of carts arrived in the morning. Joyful reunion, muster parade at noon, very strong wind, make 10 miles and camp at a lake. Uh, it's a cold night. It's, getting, it's August 31st, so. Um, and this is uh, Finlayson, is another guy who, has a, who, has, who had a diary. I went through his diaries as well, but I didn't uh, include him because most of his information is about the same. But anyways, this is one entry that uh, isn't recorded by Bagley. Uh, McLeod returns, we march six miles. Three men are sent back to cripple camp. And then he said, natives have raided the Boundary Commission depot on the White Mud River. So that may have been part of the delay. And also, there's mention that there's only 2,100 2, pounds of oats, which you think of 100, 100 pound bags, um, that's 21 bags. So that's probably not as much as they wanted. So that might have been part to do with the camping, if the depot was raided or not. Anyways, that's the end of August. I'm going to kind of wrap it up quickly here. Just give you the mileage uh, for the next few days. Uh, September the 1st, 15 miles, then 20 miles, then 18 miles, where they see a large herd of buffalo. Uh, the next day, 20 miles, they cross Stony Mountain, what they call Stony Mountain, and a band of Sioux come to their camp. Next day, uh, 18 miles, they cross a coulee, and then on September the 6th, they pass through Seven Persons Coulee 
and camp on the bank of the South Saskatchewan River. Going through Medicine Hat, you go through the big coulee heading to Calgary, and where the teepee is, that's seven persons coulee. So they've gone through seven persons coulee, and they've just gone a mile or two miles further, and then they're on the South Saskatchewan River. So that's where they camp, and uh, that's where I'm going to just end the story because we're through Saskatchewan. But I'll show you the map. I'll just finish off the story by showing on the map here what happens. So they head pretty well south there. Um, actually, uh, 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 French and McLeod, they go down to Fort Bent because there's, there's a lot of horses dying in that area. In fact, there's some more drawings by Julian of the, all the dead horses are laying around. So they're in very bad shape. They go down to Fort Benton and uh, just taken under the wing is uh, uh, the uh, IG Baker Company there. And they uh, give them anything they need. They, uh, uh, they know they're going to set up this, this uh, camp. Uh, they advise to go further west where Fort McLeod is. And they also say, Jerry, this guy named Jerry Potts here, we'll send him along. He knows all about how to get there and he's a good guy. So um, anyway, so they, they're really befriended and set up with all the supplies they need. And even the, the, the company sends out guys to go up there and build the fort, for, help build the fort for them at Fort McLeod. And uh, so everything is pretty well good. Uh, something else that, that kind of didn't happen there, um, there's also supposed to be some, some, some uh, troops going up to Fort Edmonton to support up there uh, for whatever reason, but they only got a, a, a day or two days out and they, they had no horses, no, no food to get them there, so they came back and rejoined the camp. And then, um, so McLeod goes on to establish Fort McLeod. French goes back, and here's another interesting, the first time I've seen this, is actually, this is French's uh, route back to the east. And it says Cripple Camp on there. So they pick up these guys, but also he's smart enough to stop at Wood Mountain and he buys the depot off the Boundary Commission um, guys. And so they, and, that, and he leaves two constables there, so that becomes the, the Wood Mountain Post in 1874. So they don't have, they're supposed to go up to Fort Livingston, which was supposed to be the headquarters of the North Mount Police. It's not built yet. They go up to Swan River, that's not adequate to spend the winter, they go, and they go to Fort Ellison and then back to, to Winnipeg for the winter.